Peter Daniel, welcome to Over the Bonnet. G'day, Mark. Good to be here. You're a manufacturer of camera cranes. How did that start? Oh, well, my, my um, normal answer is alcohol, really. I was, just, <laughs> I was drinking beer with too many people who are in the film television industry, and I was doing mechanical engineering uh, through college at the time, and these people said, well, why don't you design up a bit of gear? And I'd, I'd previously worked in film and television 10, 15 years before, and I thought, no way, I'm not going to do that. And then I thought about it, and I was actually, I saw something on television one day, and there was a German dolly, a, a really nice camera dolly, and I looked at that and thought, oh, I could do that. And then I started feeling it, it just caught my interest, and that just all led from there. 10 to 15 years earlier, what happened? Uh, I was in a job I didn't like. I was trying to be a salesman and a friend of mine who was in the television industry in Sydney was moving back to Canberra and he'd hired a piece of German equipment in called a Nelly Mac Dolly and down to Canberra for the day to, for a gig they were doing and it cost them three days hire. It was, you know, just one of those ridiculous setups about being in a city that wasn't quite there, didn't have this gear. From that, and once again the beers, we thought, I said, well, why don't we buy one of these bits of gear and we'll hire this out in Canberra? And we did. Long story short, we did. We imported it ourselves and we hired it out, but Canberra was a very small town then, and everyone thought it was a great idea, but they didn't want to spend the extra money on their production costs. So we got enough work to keep us alive, but we didn't make any money out of it. And then after about four or five years we got an offer from a guy in a grip in Sydney who bought it off us. We got our money back which was very lucky at that time and we thought beauty and we went different directions. He kept doing his television, his camera work and I went off into other things. You talk about being a grip or you bought it, a grip bought it from you. For people that don't know what's a grip? There's lots of names best boys and all these things in in tele in film and television that people don't really know what they are what's a grip a grip is a guy who puts the camera where the director says he wants it now you might think that's well you just put it on top of the tripod but that very rarely happens the director will say listen um, i want it hanging under the ceiling there pointing down at 45 degrees and and so the grip goes, yep, and he'll get his camera crane or his some sort of camera mount and hang it from the ceiling or he, he, he's got a truck. They usually come in, you know, nine-tonne nine Pantex and it's just full of gear with different camera stands, different... Um, that's not lighting. That's, a, that's a, a gaffer who does the lighting. This is anything to do with positioning the camera. He's got scaffold. He's got everything. And he's usually got a team of guys with him. And, you know, he talks to the director, then he comes over and says, right, guys, I want you to build a little tower here. It's got to be three minutes. So I do this and you've got 20 minutes. And um, that's what a grip does. He just positions the camera, usually in awkward positions. If it's just a standard position, the cameraman will do it. Well, the camera assistant will do it. Now, the cinematographer, not cameraman, but yeah. You were saying that you were getting interested in essentially mounts for cameras. Was there any interest? Did you ever think, oh, I want to be a cameraman? No. But I ended up being a cameraman, sort of, because I developed my my camera crane and the remote head out of... I did some mechanical engineering. I was in the fire brigade, an HD fire brigade, and I was getting a bit bored, so I went back to TAFE and did mechanical engineering. Then, through the process before the alcohol and the friends, the bad friends... I ended up excited about the prospect and so I started designing my own gear and I had no interest in being a cameraman but then I built this gear and all the local cameramen in Canberra would just shake, I couldn't, can't do it, it doesn't work and I knew that was not right. Why were they saying that? Because they had no experience in using a joystick to control pan and tilt yeah. in a head. They were hands-on cameramen and a lot of them were extremely good cameramen or cinematographers, brilliant. Nice guys too, I became very good friends with a lot of them. But they couldn't use the remote head. They, it's a different skill, it's a joystick skill. It's a, and because I didn't really know how to use the pan handle, I'd learnt from scratch. So I had a couple cats at home and I set it up in my garage 
and especially around meal time, I'd keep calling the cats in. The cats are coming, wandering, looking for the food, and I'd, so I'd just start learning. I'd follow the cats around the, the garage, and then the kids were always really good too, because my kids were little young, well, really young at the time, and I'd I'd do that as well. And so I learnt to use it. So then we went to this gig. It was a fairly big gig at the old Parliament House. And the cameramen saw me roll up and they're all looking, talking to each other. Who's on the crane? Who's on the crane? Because I took the booking, said, I'll do it. And they didn't know. And then all of a sudden they saw I had another guy swinging the crane and I was doing the, the camera. And they were all, oh, this is no good. After that, they all decided they could use it. But I, but I still kept doing it, and I still do it to this day. And I don't do as many gigs now as I used to do, but it's one of those things that's a, a learnt skill. So what's so difficult about it? Nothing, really. It's <laughs> just... it's No, no I'm serious. It, it's not that hard. But you look at the screen, and it's opposite, so it's... Yeah, but that's... Anyone can do it. Not every, It's like many things, as you'd know, Mark. Anyone can do it, but not everyone can do it well. So it takes... You've got to learn. It won't... If you're still thinking about it, think about learning to drive a car. When you're thinking about what your clutch pedal's doing, it's, it's no good. When you're not thinking about it, you can do it smooth all the time because it's just you're used to it. You look at the screen, and to me, the hand's not even involved. It's easy, but it's hard. It's easy to do, but it's not everyone can do it well. Anyone can do it, but not everyone can do it well. It's like riding a skateboard. It's like doing anything. Um, you've told me in your life you've been elite at certain things. A lot of people can paddle a kayak, but there's a tiny little bit. Like I, in my life now, I ride a mountain bike. A lot of people can ride a mountain bike, but the difference between the people that are elite and the people that just merely ride fast is it's daylight. Is that time, though? I know when I was in a kayak, I got good at it because I spent a lot of time in it. Look, there's all sorts of things that... Uh, from my point of view, it's it's not just time. You must have some natural skill. What I've got that make back to the camera, the, the the joystick control of the camera. I've got really good spatial relationships. Um, what do you put that down to? I've always had it. I've always been able to visualise things in my mind. So I could with the remote head. You you can do lots of shots. You can turn around, but a lot of people get lost. I found I very rarely got lost. And the more I do it, I wouldn't get lost. I'd always know where I was. So you'd be doing a, a dump shot, panning, twisting over a crowd, but then you'd tilt up to be exactly where you want to be. So you'd tilt up on the scoreboard or the tree with the sunset behind it or whatever you, you're trying to aim for. Because I had a really good spatial relation. I think I still have about, I know where I am. It's like I can still reverse park my car. Most people do it once for their license and then they try never to do it again. <laughs> and, I, you know, it's stuff like that. It's just knowing where things are around you. As a fireman, you got into mechanical engineering. What was the trigger to go to such a drastic change in career? Well, I didn't see it as that drastic. In the fire brigade, you're using a lot of mechanical... Um, the, the trucks are designed and built by mechanical engineers. Pumps are very much a mechanical engineering thing. I suppose I was getting a little bit bored. Um, I enjoyed my time as the fire brigade in the fire brigade, but it was my job. It wasn't my life, and most of the guys I was working with, it was their life. They wouldn't associate with anyone but other fireys. They'd wow. go away on golf trips, they'd go on fishing trips, which is all good fun, and I went on some of them, but I had my life and I'd go and do things. So I was interested in a lot of other things. I read a lot of science fiction when I was younger, and I still do today. So I was always interested in different things. And I got bored, so I went back to school, and I finished year 12. I'd tried to start uni a couple of times, but I'd never got there. I'd never done more than a couple of semesters. And then, so I went back to night school and just did year 11, 12 maths and physics again at a higher level for a bit of interest and then I started looking at what was going on around me and the local TAFE was doing two-year mechanical engineering course so I applied for that and got it and I did that full-time in two years while I was working in the fire brigade while I had two kids under five and while my wife was working full-time because I was interested in it and it was easy because I was going to, to school with 
kids who were wearing their baseball caps backwards and <laughs> you know they were there because they had nowhere better to go so it was easy because I was in the, at that stage I was mid to late 30s it was I wanted to do it so there's no point in being there unless you're going to do it how important do you think adult education is because often people will apply themselves better than when as you say kids are there because they have to be I think education is one of the most important things we can pass on to other people but we need to give them interest and that's why a good teacher is worth their weight in gold because they are brilliant you know if they can we can all think back to teachers we've had that just don't fit that category and there's always hopefully most of us got a teacher or a couple of teachers that inspired you because they were excited about what they're doing like I've had physics teachers that you, you just you know you nearly knock yourself out falling asleep on the <laughs> desk and other guys who actually explain to you how this relates to real life and that's what physics is and as I said before I was interested in science fiction so after doing a bit of physics I go god I can actually work out how much thrust you'd need to lift this rocket off the surface of the moon and you know that's that's real world stuff but how old were you when you were thinking along these lines because that ain't a typical teenager Oh, no, that was back in my mid-30s when I was starting to do the physics at right. the mechanical engineering. And but it was, still, it's it's thinking outside not, the box. Yeah, well, I'm, that's, I suppose that's one of my other skills. I don't do things like other people do. And because of it, I get myself in a lot of trouble. When you were a fireman, do you have any highlights that do you, when you mull back and you remember what you were doing? As you say, it was just a job for you. Why did you get into the fire brigade in the first place? Because I'd always been self-employed, I'd just got a mortgage, I'd just got married, there was a couple of kids on the way. There was that thing about, oh, I'm early 30s, or I was 30 when I joined the fire brigade, um, I'd better get serious about this life thing, I'm starting to work out this is, this is it, this isn't a dress rehearsal, you know, all the old cliches that everyone says. And so the fire brigade was a really good opportunity to be a bit serious about life, but it was also because it was shift work, it was... It gave me a lot of time to other things. It gave me time to know my kids. I knew both, both my kids very well. I still do. You know, they're 28 <laughs> and 29 now, and still very good terms with them. Um, it was just it was it was partly lifestyle, but it was also a, a good, not a great income, but a reasonable income, and it just made life much easier for a while. Does anything stick out of what happened while you're on the in the trucks and on the tools in the fire brigade? ACT was, is a modern, Canberra is a modern city, so most of our buildings there are built very well. Um, they can, the bigger buildings look after themselves very well in, because of modern fire control. You know, went to a few um, house fires, things would get a bit exciting sometimes. There's nothing really much more exciting than going into a burning building with your breathing apparatus on. I didn't do it a lot, and I... You know, I didn't do anything in my whole time in the fire brigade that I would consider would people could call me a hero because it's not what it was about. But it was a bit of a self-test on occasions. Um, there was, you know, we'd go and do motor vehicle accidents and rescue. They could be quite nasty, but at the same time, I found them... Uh, that they were more fulfilling because you're really... You could seriously helping people. Someone's stuck in a car and you're getting them out. It's It's a job well done. And it didn't always end well, but... It wasn't your fault, and you, you were there, and you were trying. My, my time in the fire brigade, I look, I look back, and I, I'm really lucky. I don't have, I've never had any PTSD of any sort whatsoever. But when I was in the fire brigade, it was a different culture. I got there just as a new culture arrived. And if you ever went to a bad job, the, the union would come in straight away, and we had counsellors, they'd be talking to you. But it wasn't that so much. That was more boring than anything. It was your mates would ring you up two days later and say, "Hey, Pete, how are you, are you okay? Want to grab a beer?" And you and that and you'd do the same for them, because we'd learnt that, or the fire brigade had learnt that toughen up, princess, just doesn't work, and it didn't work. And but maybe I'm just a different case. Maybe I just don't care enough. But I know there was guys I went through that did have still have trouble with PTSD, but um, I was lucky. I was only there for 14 years. I mean, I was on. I was working when the Canberra bushfires hit in 2003. That was more frustration than anything else. It was, Why is that? Well, you've got to be nice. No, um, you don't. No, you do, because you know. Um, 
<laughs> the ST Fire Brigade was a really good fire brigade when two or three trucks would get together and tackle a job. The guys on the trucks were really good. Sometimes senior management getting involved didn't make things better. How's that? Guys in senior management, for the most part, are the guys who know how to play the game, not the guys who know how to fight the fires. And so they'd spend minimal time on the trucks. That can be frustrating. But as I said, it wasn't my life. Yeah. It was my job. And, yeah, it was frustrating, but I knew I was never going to be there for long. And, look, it, look, it, was, it was a really good job, and I don't want to... I don't want to bring down the ACT Fire Brigade, lovely fire brigade, lovely people, still know a lot of them. But if, like, okay, there's one guy, no names, but he's 20 minutes away in a car, two trucks have rolled up to a building that's well alight, and the message he gives across the radio is, don't do anything till I get there. Say no more. You know, that's the end of it. You know, of course the guys went, yeah, right, and they just put it out. <laughs> Yeah. But that sort of mentality, you just, you know. And I was never, but see, I was never, I've never been involved in politics of any sort, people politics at all. I've just never been doing it. And people would be getting really uptight about stuff. And I'd just be going, oh, I'm going home in three hours. <laughs> it was a great job. I loved it. When my kids were little, I loved it. But then I had opportunities. I did mechanical engineering. I started doing the other things. And I got out of it and I never looked back. The 2003 Canberra bushfires, as you were saying. So what happened there? What was your part in that? I was just a fiery, doing, trying to do my job. It was, um, it was a fire that started northwest of Canberra in New South Wales probably two weeks before by a lightning strike. Very rough terrain. No one could get to it. It was in the millennium drought, so things were very dry. And it gradually got worse and worse and worse. And then... I did day shift on a Thursday and a Friday. I was due to work on the Saturday night, but big winds came up on the Saturday morning and about half the fire brigade self-responded on the Saturday when it was obvious it was coming into the suburbs. And, you know, a lot of guys got out in trucks and did the best they could, but, you know, we lost 500 houses or something, which was something we'd never seen because these weren't houses that were... They'd caught a light, then we'd get there and put them out. These are houses that were burnt to the ground. And, you know, it was 500, and that's quite a lot. So, you know, we're just thinking, well, that's pretty weird. But it, it's an act of God. We had pine forests to the northwest of Canberra, and once the fires got into the pine forests, I mean, those things go like... They're satellite photos, uh, and there's just this massive dark cloud from Canberra, you know to 100 k's or so out in the Tasman Sea and that dark cloud is all of the ACT pine forests in the air because it just they all went in one afternoon once they got in those pine forests and it just swung around and it probably impacted five or six suburbs at once but one two suburbs were badly burnt um, I don't know statistics there was a couple of people lost their lives but very lucky there wasn't more we had one fire truck literally burnt to the ground we had a couple others quite badly singed, but no, we didn't lose any guys. We didn't, no one got hurt that I'm aware of. You say going into a building in your BA... Mm, breathing apparatus, yeah. ...could be reasonably exhilarating, but frightening? Yeah, very frightening, first couple of times, because you can't... It's not like you see on television. You can't see anything. There's nothing there. It's black. So you have to feel... I mean, if the house is well, like, you have to feel your way in. I mean, you can know when there's fire there because you can feel it. But that, the training is really, really good. We do a lot of hot fire training. It was, um, oh, you know, it was, it was quite, it, it, what I'd say it would be accelerated. It's like a lot of things. When you finished it, you go, wow, that's good. But um, at the time, maybe it would be nicer to be somewhere else. But it was your job. It's what you had to do. I was very lucky the whole time I was in the brigade. I never came across a person that was badly burnt or or dead in a fire. So I didn't have that trauma, but I know guys who went into houses and there was a couple of dead children in there. And that was terrible for them. It was terrible for everyone because we'd all feel it. But we were, we were more worried about how them and how it was respect. So I never had any of that. So for me to sit here and say I don't have PTSD, the reason is I'd never had a really bad experience. Because I know that when I was a news cameraman, I'd see a lot, it didn't really affect me. Is it just your personality that 
you didn't attach to certain things that happened? Well, I had young kids at the time, and young kids are amazing things. When you see something bad, you go home and hug your kids and you get involved with life again, and it's, and it's really good. The first time I saw, went to a fatal car accident, it sort of blew me away a bit, but then I get home and there's little kids jumping over you. Like I'm talking two and three or one and two because our kids are really close together. It's, you know, that's the meaning of life right there. So you, you can get on top of it again pretty quickly. Mechanical engineering, you're working fireman by day and by night and also studying at the same time. What sort of pressure was on you at this time? No pressure that I didn't want. It was like they say, you know, I think of myself as a fairly lazy person. Um, <laughs> my current partner says, I don't know anyone who does more than you, but she doesn't know me. I know me best. But the point is, I wanted to be there, so I was working hard. And they say that if you want something done, give it to a busy person, because they're always busy. If you give it to the guy who's sitting on the couch, or the woman who's sitting on the couch, all they can do is sit on the couch. They don't want to do anything else. So at the time, it was no, it was good. It was really full on two years, but it was good. As a busy person, there's lots of sitting around in between jobs in the fire brigade. Did you find that hard? Well, I would read a lot, and for the two years I was studying, I'd study a lot. Um, we ended up watching, you know, too much television. Um, we would try and get out a lot. We'd go out and do just, you get to know your area. You'd go and check the hydrants, because the hydrants would fill up with dirt or the ants would mess them up. I mean, you'd do stuff like that all the time. A bit of maintenance on the gear, though we weren't really qualified or allowed to do in-depth maintenance, but you'd just keep stuff clean, make sure stuff's working, especially the rescue gear you'd start it up. start of every shift, you go and check your BA. Well, you're supposed to. Not everyone did, but I always did. And um, it worked out well, because if you ever needed it, you knew it was there. What about the physical side of what you were doing? Well, when I look back at it, I was, I was a bit of a slob when I was in the fire brigade. I was, um, <laughs> I was 100 kilos. I wasn't particularly fit, but there was no real requirement at that time to be physically physically fit you had to be physically fit to get in but you didn't have to keep it up to any level and there was always the guys the triathletes all these guys there was always the really cutting edge fit guys but then there was the guys who weren't fit and some of them were downright unfit or obese but that was just the job at the time i believe now it's quite different see i haven't been in the brigade for 17 years Okay, so you've got this mechanical engineering degree. How did you start to go, okay, what am I going to do with it? Well, that was the thing, as I said before. I was just, I had loose ideas of what I might do, just look at just everyday products and things and redesign. But I never really got into that sort of thing because I started doing this television gig or building the television equipment. And one thing led to another. I did a trade show in Sydney. Um, some so what were you selling at the trade show uh, a, a camera jib arm or i call it a camera crane which is a basically a long pole you'll see them at sporting events or on movie sets or whatever it's where and they make the camera move through the air before drones came along these were the things they used and they still do use them and the building the remote heads was really quite interesting that was a bit that i really liked but that was also involving electronics which i'm not very good at, so I would always have to contract other guys to do the electronics. But it, it worked out okay in the end. So camera cranes, how did you get, you know, transfer into actually doing your, your dollies and those sort of camera mounts to a full-on crane? How did that all come about? I was just, I was still in the fire brigade, so I had time. I would just sit there. I had a, a, bought a, CAD, a reasonable CAD program. So I just designed it all up on this CAD program and I, I just designed the whole thing first. And I designed it out of my my own mind. But these things have been around for since people have been making movies. So it wasn't a new idea. It wasn't a it was my version of the wheel. It wasn't a new idea. There was things I did that was totally different than what other people did. Like what? The way I did the tripods, the way I did the mounts, just the way I did everything, because it was I was making it up from scratch. But the thing is, if you're trying to achieve the same thing, you can come at it from, you know, 50 different angles, but you're always going to end up with something that's pretty similar because 
you're trying to get it to be as simple as you possibly can. So you'd line up, you'd go to a trade show and you'd see five or six different camera cranes around the place. And from a distance to a layman, that all looked pretty much the same, but you get down to the nitty gritty and they'd all be really different. What's the main difference between different cranes? What do you look for when you're looking at, say, a trade show? You go in and you're having a look. What do you, what do you look for? Uh, ease of use. That's what I always tried with mine. I made mine out of carbon fibre, which no one else did at the time, and I'm, I still don't think they do, because carbon fibre is very expensive, but it also gives you some wonderful opportunities. It's really light. For a 10-metre camera crane, which it's 10 metres from the pivot point to where the camera sits, and then there's another two metres out the back, so it's 12 metres long. So in a crane of that size, there's only 18 kilos of carbon fibre. And the lighter your crane is, that's the less weights you have to put on the back to counterbalance it. And so the whole thing masses less, so it's easier to use, more nimble to use. But I suppose my main point in my design was to make it quick and simple and easy to put together without having to use any special tools. Just everything would do hand nuts everywhere and hand bolts because they, they make it easy. You can't over tighten them. People always want to over tighten things. Why is that, do you think? Oh, they're stupid. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it's, I don't know. Cause I think it's because people don't understand what a thread does and how it works and you've got to do it tight. I mean, so many things, you know, just around houses get destroyed because people just want to do it really tight or if they're putting, trying to put a screw in somewhere and it doesn't work, they just try harder and they destroy the thread. It's just un misunderstanding. That's why I thought if I use hand nuts everywhere, you only tighten it up as, as tight as you can with your hand nut. So is that what sets yours apart, that ease of, ease of use? Oh, well, I'd like to think so. Um, none, none of them out there were really clunky, but some of them needed special tools. One of the other major competitors out there, the, the sections were smaller and each section needed to go together with three Allen head bolts. And while it wasn't that tricky, you're putting a steel screw into an aluminium thread. You can only do that so many times before someone does it and cross threads it or the thread just wet threads will wear out so i didn't have anything like that on mine mine was just um, circular clamps and carbon fiber tubes that slipped over an internal tube and tighten it up one-handed and there it goes together it went together really quick you could build one person if you're if you're in a situation where you could get your all the bits to where you wanted to build it you could do it in half an hour one person 10 meter crane easily is that because it's so simple? That was the, my idea. I wanted it to be so simple. I used to advertise the what is it, the lightest, quickest setup camera crane in the world. And you know, when you're trying to promote your gear, you always make these grandiose claims. But I think it was. I'd never, I never saw one that was lighter or quicker. There was a, a there's a company in. Germany or England, and maybe it might be England. They make a product called um, Polecam, and it's like a big fishing rod with a little lightweight head on the end. And it's very quick to set up and very manoeuvrable and very easy. It's all gravity assisted and everything. It's a totally different thing. You can't put a big camera on it. You can only put a tiny little one of the a new little I don't know what you call them, tiny little digital camera on it. A little handy cam sort of thing. No, smaller than that. Wow. Tiny, like a little lipstick camera type thing. Yeah. But they get the, the cameras are so good nowadays. You'd, it's not in the chip anymore. It's in the software that's driving the chip. And so, you know, the, but of course those products w would sell for one and a half times the cost of my products. You've seen technology evolve, especially in the television industry and film industry. How do you think technology is evolving and helping is it better the stuff that they're putting out these days or is it more throwaway it's not really throwaway it's just evolved so quick and there's a big need to have the latest because the guys who are employing you want to have the latest so the equipment's still built pretty well like it's beautiful some of the cameras and stuff beautifully made but if it's five years old it's like it's ancient it's out of date that was another reason i went with camera cranes because it's a mount camera mounts the hardware the physical hardware stays around 
for a long time. But if you're using the electronics, the technical stuff, it just it's just so out of date so quickly. And I'd go to trade shows and I'd get, you'd walk through the trade shows and there'd be 90%, I'd call them black boxes. And it's, oh yeah, this box will bring your signal in here and it'll sync it with that one and it'll change all your colours and it'll lengthen it and shorten it and which is fantastic. But then that bit, that black box would be out of date. In six months' time, there'd be another one. I had a guy, I was at a trade show one day, and I was talking to this guy who was selling this particular form of black box, and he was a software engineer. And I could tell he wasn't happy. He was getting out. And I said, what's the problem? He said, I hate it. He said, software is never finished. No matter what you do, someone's going to come along and say, can you make it do this? Well, you can, but then you've got to rewrite the software and do that. Now, well, can you make it do this? And it's, so he was, he had to get out, he had to go and do something else because of the never finished category. Whereas my designs, they were finished. I mean, they would evolve, but once you've built it, it's done. Can you make it do this? Well, no, because it does that. It's all, you know, can you make that ladder into, you know, a plank? Well, I mean, people do that nowadays, but no, it's, it's better as a ladder. When you, um, you built your first crane, what happened then? Well, I used it around the place in Canberra a little bit, and then I went up to a trade show in Sydney called SEMPTE, S-M-P-T-E. That's the big industry one. In Australia, it was at that stage every two years, and I sold that crane to a production company up in Newcastle. Did you buy it to sell it, or were you going to use it yourself? No, I used it myself. I used it myself for 18 months, and then I took it to the trade show, and then I sold it. And that was built out of aluminium, and, you know, it was pretty clunky I thought it was brilliant at the time but looking back it was pretty clunky so then I went home and with the money I got for that I built another aluminium crane but already I was starting to look at carbon fiber because I thought that'd be a brilliant product and then that would have been 1999 and then I got myself a gig working in the Olympics with a company called camera core and they were in charge of all the specialist cameras if it was on a tripod, they didn't do it, but everything else, anything hanging from a ceiling or on tracks or on cables or whatever, they were in charge of it. And I got to work with them for, I think, seven or eight weeks for the Olympics, which was a really good gig. Got exposed to some really nice equipment. Um, I learned a lot, uh, met a lot of people, and I came out of that with a bit of money in the bank. And then I started looking for carbon fibre and I found carbon fibre and I sold my second aluminium crane about the same time and I just started building cranes out of carbon fibre after that and I've built I think it's up around 86 cranes or something now it's not a huge amount compared to some of the other overseas guys but the design from the first carbon fibre crane to the ones I build now it's very clear that they're the same product it's just a really good product. It's lightweight. It's incredibly strong, easy to transport. It's good. And the guy who's selling it to me, his company up in um, Cornell in Sydney, Composite Spars and Tube, they're doing amazingly well. When I first started buying off him, he was producing carbon fiber tubes in his backyard. Now he's got this factory in Cornell. And he, I don't know how many people he employs probably 40, 50 people. It's nice to see growth like that. That's obviously, he's got a quality product. Oh, it's amazing. And I'm, you know, he's a really, really, he's a really nice guy. And the people that work for him are pretty good. But he's really busy and really successful. And my problem is now, oh, um, Clive, I, um, I need a little bit of carbon fibre. And I think he feels a bit, because I've been one of his customers from the very beginning, he feels like he needs to do it. But if he's got a, you know... $300,000 contract with a mining company doing pressure vessels or something. You can't stop that to put, you know, $7,000 of carbon fibre on the on the line for me. So it's good and bad. It is. Um, it's interesting. I, I bought a kayak um, paddle, a blade from, from a guy, and he started out in his backyard and his shed and then grew from there. It, it, it is nice to see people follow their passion as you are doing, and he obviously does, and see it grow. Mm. You must enjoy doing what you love. Well, I do, um, and and I still do. But I mean, I'm in my sixties now, and I'm I'm winding down. Um, I'm not selling many cranes anymore. There's a lot of competition from 
China and other places. And that's good. Competition's good. I'm never going to say competition's bad. Um, but I still get a buzz when I use one of my bits of gear or I see one of my bits of gear and I get my hands on it and I pull the part. And, yeah, I get a real buzz out of it. It gives me a lot of joy. But I'm definitely... I'm no longer... You know, at one stage I thought, well, you know, I can, I can make some real money out of this. But my life hasn't been about money ever because I've never been that money guy. If I was, I would have been rich at 30. But, I, you know, I've always had enough. I'm very comfortable and happy where I am now. And I'm still making cranes, but just to order. Probably didn't do anything last year. Last year was a year we all know about, 2020. Um, I sold a couple the year before that. I've um, got a couple going this year. I mean, I've still got c- contacts in places like Russia, and for some reason they like my cranes over there. There's a guy that I follow on Instagram, and every couple of weeks he puts up new shots with one of my cranes there in Russia. Ma- he's making movies. and So what happened when the, the Russian... What, what was the interaction with that? Well, I got scared at first because they're Russians. But, <laughs> um, no, no, they're really straightforward guys, and um, the interaction was, we've seen one of your cranes... Because I sold one into Italy that ended up in a higher company, higher company in Moscow, and then these guys saw it there, and I think I've sold three or four into Russia at different places, and they just they like the simplicity of it, and they like the way it goes together, and it's carbon fibre and you know machined aluminium and you know anodised black mostly, and it's it looks a bit stealth. So it looks good, you know. Do you get to go over to commission these things or just is it sent over as a flat pack? Uh, I generally just freight them over. But I have been to a lot of places. Like I've sold, I've never been to Russia, but sold cranes into England, um, Germany, Spain, um, Italy, uh, quite a few into Singapore. Sold about 25, 30 into China over the years, which was really good selling something to China rather than the other way and not raw materials, a, a product. Haven't sold any into China for a long time. That market's changed. They build their own now, uh, much cheaper than I can sell it to them. Are they getting better? Because originally their cranes were pretty substandard from yeah, what I believe. Yeah, Ch- China is, um, they, they're getting, they can build, they can build anything as good as anyone. They, their initial issues were trying to make it that they were competing on price everywhere but they're you know they're smart cookies i've spent a lot of i've been to china 19 times and i quite um i've always felt safe in china i've always liked china they'll do anything really really good but if you're in a that i have my own opinions on places i don't know what actually goes on but they they seem to me like they were just trying to compete on price and they were just copying everyone's stuff but now they're being innovative and they're making their own. I read somewhere the other day that in China alone they've got two over 200 electric vehicle companies. Wow. And coming this year that there's going to be start importing sub $35,000 electric vehicles from China into Australia, despite what our government thinks. And not about China, about electric vehicles. Um, it's just the way of the future. I mean, they're just such a massive population and... They've got a massive population that they're dragging into the middle class. And they're, you know, I, I'm not interested in politics and what's going on with all the other argy bargy between different governments in the world. I mean, if they're anything like ours, they're not much chop. So. Is the saying that doesn't matter whoever you vote for, you'll always elect a politician? Well, that's what we do. I don't know what they do over there, but I think it's a slightly different system. <laughs> okay, you mentioned the Olympics. Yeah. What happened then? It must have been a pretty exciting time. 2000, the Sydney Olympics, and you had essentially a front row seat. Yeah, I did. Um, look, it was just a good job. I just was trying to sell the a guy, um, one of my cranes, and he said, you know, that's good, Pete, but do you want to come work for me in Sydney? I went, oh, okay. So that's good. So um I got a job up there and worked for him and look yeah I was at the main stadium and I you know saw the opening ceremony so often I was sick of it because there was lots of rehearsals and I was there on the the big night and I saw Kathy Freeman do all her um you know the heats and 
the qualifiers and semi-finals and then I was there I was on the edge of the track I was at about the 250 meter mark you know 10 meters off the track hiding in the shadows as she ran past in the final and that was a big moment and I remember looking around and the whole stadium was just alight with flash photography and it was amazing it was a good really good thing and um what was the pole vaulter at the Sydney Olympics? Um, the Russian girl who came to Australia. Um, oh, I can see a blonde lady. Yeah, very attractive lady. And my job at that time was we had all these little cameras in the pits where the, the pole vaulters would put their pole in. But they used to keep knocking the cameras. So I'd have to rush up in between vaults and get the camera and line it up with a little makeup brush and get all the sand off it and everything. And so I'm there once again kneeling in the shadows as all these people... I think it was Tatiana Grigorieva or something. That's wasn't it? the one, yes. Something like that. Spot on. But, um, yeah, it was a good time. Lots of good memories. I remember one night just looking, staring there, and it was just gone dusk and the Olympic flames burning, and I'm going, I'm going to have to try and remember this. But there's other less glamorous things too. I was on my feet so long, and I bought new boots before I went, and they didn't fit properly. And I remember <laughs> sitting in the middle of the Olympic Stadium one night, and I had my boots off and I'm squeezing blisters. But I, once again, I was in the shadows. No one could see me. But So it goes from one extent to the other, you know. Cathy Freeman's winning 400 metres and I'm squeezing blisters. So they're all different sorts of memories. Is that where you like to be, in the shadows? Oh, I'm definitely a behind-the-scenes guy. I'm not, look at me, look at me, by any means. Well, I don't think I am. Other people should probably make that, <laughs> that call, not me. What was the highlight for you? Was it Kathy in the 400 for at the Olympics? It's probably one of the things I remember most. It wasn't really a highlight for me. I At the time, I remember I was worried for her, for the pressure that the whole country had put on her. And it was made me very happy to see that she did win and with the grace that she did it. And then just recently in the last year, I saw her, 20 years on, they did a, ABC or someone did a doco on her and she's still a really wonderful person a wonderful Australian talking and just talking back and someone in her position could have had so much bitterness and she doesn't appear to have any bitterness why is that because of the way we've treated the aboriginals in Australia over the years and there's a lot of bitterness there and quite rightly so she didn't have any bitterness and you know she had every right to be bitter and um, I thought that just made her even a greater person. And she, it's like what I'm trying to say is I don't know her, I've never met her, and I've seen her like everyone else winning races. But when you hear her talking, she seems to be the real deal, the real person, not just someone who can run really fast. You're sitting there in the shadows watching these super athletes perform. How did you feel? Did you feel, oh, wow, I'm so far off the mark? Did they, was, it, was it something that you compared yourself to these guys? No, well, I'd never really been interested in athletics. I'd worked out a long time ago that athletics is really cutthroat. Like you go to a, I did it, covered a few athletic events earlier on, like Australian championships and things, and you see all these young people out there and they're the peak physical condition and there's, they're just, they've given their whole lives to be here. The person who comes first, yay. The person who comes second and third, mm, First no, loser, second loser. <laughs> no, no one else gets a, gets a look in, you know. Yeah. Not that it means it was a total waste of men because they're still very fit and they have a good time. And I mean, I've got a friend whose daughter was um, on the very edges of being elite and in athletics and she had a scholarship to go to an American University bit through her running just before she went. She ended up with a stress fracture in her knee, which ended her career. And she was devastated at the time, but she's, you know, she's a good young kid and she's gone on to do other stuff and she got over it. But that's what I think about. Uh, that I'd never want to be an athlete. I mean, when I was young, I could run fast because I was a big kid. And I always used to come first or second in the running races once a year, but I never put any effort into it, you know. It was not, it was just something up because I was tall and I could run. You talk about covering the athletics. What sort of events as a crane operator have you covered? What sort of things have you, and different events, have you covered over your time? Well, it, it's not so much as crane operator. Any event at something like the Olympics has got 20, 30 cameras on it, and the crane's just one of them. 
So, you know, anything that was on there, you know, usually the crane just does a wide shot. So all the tight shots will be done from other cameras and then the crane will come in and sweep across the crowd with the event in the background. It's just to give movement, it's just to give a sense of place, I suppose. I've worked with directors who try to think that cranes are the ones where you should be getting all the close-ups off, and that's a disaster because you can't do it. It's Why not is that? Because you've got a wide-angle lens for a start, right? and when you zoom right into the end of, of your lens, even if it's a wide-angle lens, all your movements become very super critical, and it's very hard to do it. You can do it, but it doesn't look as good. It doesn't look anywhere near as good as with someone who's got a long lens and a stable platform. That's... I'm not a director. Directors don't listen to me. What sort of work have you done when you've worked with directors and what sort of interesting jobs have you had as a crane operator? There's um, a few concerts. I don't mind concerts. They're pretty good. Um, mainly concerts like benefit concerts or you know Christmas concerts down in Canberra with the ABC at that time. I can't really remember who was on, but there's obviously stars of the day. I've done a bit of uh, Tiger Tasmania for... About six or seven years, I'd, they'd call me down there. That was a really good gig because we'd just go out in the morning. They'd tell us they want us to be at this corner, this corner, and this corner. So you'd go out, set up 120 cars and come past. That was on day one. By day <laughs> four, you might be, you know, 80 cars had come past. But um, that was really good because you're out outside in the open. It was just lovely country down there. So that was a good job. I used to do summer nats in Canberra every year and... The main job I'd do there was cover the burnout pit, but that was an awful, awful job. It was just so noisy and so filthy, dirty. It was terrible. It was, it was, I didn't like it. In the end, I was so happy when I didn't have to do it anymore. Last time I was asked to do it, I actually physically started laughing when the guy rang me up and said, oh, I want you to come. And I just laughed. I said, mate, I hope you're going well, but you couldn't pay me enough money. I'm not going to do it. And the year before that, I tried to price myself out. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't want to do it. He said, no, no, you need to do it. I said, well, it's going to cost you five grand. He said, no, no way. And I said, well, that's the point. I'm trying to price myself out. And I actually told him, that's what I said. And he said, oh, there you go, okay. So he hung up. <laughs> Two hours later, he rang me back and said, okay, five grand. But that's including GST. <laughs> and I went, oh, really? And so I went and did it. But then that was the last time. Because... It, it was dangerous as well. It was bad for your health because it was so noisy, bad for your ears. Um, the smoke, everything was just ridiculous, the fumes. You couldn't see the screen in front of your face, at, you know, 500 mils in front of your face because it's too much smoke. Having said that, there's some really good shots of cars just sliding around and when you see it put to music, you know, it looked really nice. But at the time when you were there, it was bloody awful. Didn't like it. Did you think of going overseas and really focusing on just being a crane operator? No, it was never my thing. I only did the crane operating as a means to an ends to promote my product. And it just worked out that sometimes I got quite a bit of work, but mostly not that much. So you were taking it out, essentially showcasing it to sell it? Yeah, that was the whole idea. COVID has not been so kind then, as you say, you didn't sell any last year. No. Um, what happened? Because I am the age I am now, I am i don't owe any money to anyone. That's how I dealt with it. It's so much easier if you don't owe any money. And because of my 14 years in the fire brigade, 17 years ago, I had a small pension coming in. It was enough to see me through. I've got a wonderful partner and she's self-employed and in a similar position and we built a house down the coast that we own. It was just, we, I felt so lucky during COVID. I was in an incredible position. If I was living in a city and stuck in a one bedroom apartment by myself with one other person, I mean, I can see how that would be crazy, but I was legally allowed to go to the beach and walk every day. <laughs> I was legally allowed to get on my bike and go for a ride. And I live on a half acre block with a good veggie garden. You know, I, I didn't enjoy it, but compared to other people, I felt I almost had survivor guilt. I was just, it was so, I was so well off compared to most other people I knew and compared to people who went through the massive lockdowns in Melbourne or compared to what's happening overseas. You know, we, we're 
pretty lucky here in Australia, generally speaking. People should go overseas if they want to have a whinge about this place. You were just doing it to, to showcase your products. So did you you think of, you know, it, it wasn't, was it ever um, the thought to, um, to extend that? Did you get asked to be in um, different films, television? Not really, because I was never really pushing for it. You know, I did, as I picked up, I picked up a lot of student films for a while there. I was doing, working on student films and my, my price would be, you know, a case of beer or maybe two cases of beer if it was two <laughs> nights, which was fine because I was happy. It didn't worry me. Once again, I didn't know any money and I figured it was playing the long game. You know, you, you get your product out there and people may come back and buy one later. And that did happen down the track too. People would buy stuff or people would ring you up and they actually had money and ask you to come and do a job with them. So from that point of view, I never regretted that. I mean, as I said before, money has never been a huge drive for me. It's nice to have it, but I've worked out that whatever you get, you spend. So if I earn more, I just spend more. What about drones? They are really taking over. They can get the aerial photography that uh, once was just the sole area of a crane. What do you think about the whole drone experience? I know very little about drones, but I think they're fantastic. They're not, I mean, they're not, cranes do different things. You can hold a much bigger camera, you can do more of a set move, but drones are brilliant, but I don't know much about them. A lot of people said you should get into drones, and I said, why? Everyone else is. So it's never been an interest of mine. My brother's one of these geeks. He's a nice guy, I love my brother, but he's one of these geeks. He spends, he's retired now, so he spends all his time flying drones like he's probably flying a drone now as we speak <laughs> and he races and he does all sorts of things but i've never never really been interested in them i think they're amazing technology but they're not for me i might get more interested when you get personal drones that you can actually fly around in and then you know the chinese are building them so and not just the chinese there's others who are building them so that's sort of that's interesting but I think they're wonderful, but I don't really have much of an opinion on them because I've never really looked into them. Are they, you say you can, you can take a, a heavier camera on a crane. Um, so they both have their, their own position in broadcasting, for want of a better term. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've heard some... Yeah, they do. They're wonderful. And, you know, some of the bigger drones do take bigger cameras, but then there's a lot more risk involved. As um, I know of... A couple of drones that have come down very hard and turned a you know hundred and fifty thousand dollar camera and lens into a lot of bolts <laughs> and bits of broken glass and circuit boards. So you know there's risks with everything. I mean people have broken cameras on cranes as well. I'm lucky. There's no wood here to touch. <laughs> but I'm lucky. Um, I haven't. I've had a couple of close misses. What happens? What's the biggest danger when you are? What are you looking for? What what sort of thing? You've got a 10-metre crane. Um, well, the, the danger is hitting someone and hurting them. That's the biggest danger. Um, or the other danger is being hit. And the the worst thing that I think has happened to me was I was covering Rock of Stedfords one year. I was travelling around Australia doing Rock of Stedfords and it was a fairly um, low-budget production, so I was doing it by myself and this young girl just suddenly did all these cartwheels across the stage as she was supposed to do and her heel hit the lens of the camera and it did a bit of damage to the camera but thankfully didn't hurt her um scared crap out of me <laughs> um but that was you know that was a, that was a bad day i didn't like that day at all i went home i bought a bottle of bourbon went home and drank it and i don't drink bourbon i'd have still to this day i don't know why i drank bourbon but i went home and drank bourbon it's interesting that you say, well, you've seen tragedy in the fire brigade, but that's affected you where you've actually hit a girl, but not badly. She hit me, but I was in the wrong place because she was on the stage and it was her stage and I was just looking and she hit me. So it was my fault. But um, yeah, no, well, it didn't affect me badly. It just, I didn't have a good day. It was yeah. a bad day. You know, you have bad days. Yeah. But I suppose coming out of the fire brigade, what I, the whole premise behind my designs was safety. I've never had one fall apart. It can't. People have had cranes fall over. People, it's happened a lot, but none of mine have ever fallen over. I've had one blown over in a, in a storm once. We weren't working at the time. We were trying to pull it down because it was a 
incredible earth-shattering thunderstorm in Malaysia trying to pull it down and the wind came up and we just got the camera off and all of a sudden looked behind me and the crane's cartwheeling down the road didn't get hurt no one got hurt picked it up straightened it up used it the next day but it was all about the design was primarily about safety because you can't because you're I'm responsible I'm the designer I mean sure you have insurance but there's other things that you've got to live with yourself and you just things can't fall apart yeah, w- w- the wind and weather. Uh, how much of a factor is that when you're setting up for a shoot and you're out? It's obviously outside for most of what you're doing. It's a, it's a huge factor, and some days you just can't get the shots. Some days you just say, "Sorry, I'm bringing it down." It gets to a point. What I tell people I sell a crane to is, "You're the safety officer, and it's up to you." And if I'm ever operating a crane, I just say I, it's the same thing. I'll say, "No, this is not safe." I'll put it down. It doesn't matter what anyone says. I'm sorry, it's not safe. And you don't push on after that because if you do, you're a fool. Or whoever's telling you to is a fool. Because if you hurt someone, what happens then? Absolutely. What about, as you say, the, the, the com- other cranes falling apart? That oh, Look, I don't know every instance, but all the ones I've heard, it's human, human fault. It's people not putting things, people saying, yeah, I know how to do this and not knowing how to do it. Don't put bolts incorrectly, put something on incorrectly. The last one I heard was a guy was operating a crane down in Melbourne and he told everyone I knew what he was doing. He didn't know what he was doing and they were doing a shoot and the weight bucket fell off the back, which of course means the camera and everything goes flying down to the ground. Camera got smashed, no one was hurt, luckily no one was hurt, but the guy who... um, had the crane, it wasn't one of my cranes, the guy, he had one of my cranes, but he wasn't using it, he was using another one. He then had to run around and find a whole lot of new bits for his for his head, and the guy whose camera it was, well, that was a destroyed camera, so lots of things come off. But if there'd been someone standing underneath it, it would have killed them. Mm. So there's no there's no time for that sort of rubbish. What's the biggest danger then when you when when in that operating? Is it just the fact that things are, can fall, gravity? Yeah, gravity. You're working above people's heads. If people... Like I've, I've been working... I was working at a, a job in Sydney one day and we were, we were about to do a crane shot. It was in this building, I think it would have been... could have been Commonwealth Bank or something or something like that. Anyway, it was a big head office in Sydney and it was, the building was built around this huge atrium. So we're up on about the seventh or eighth floor and we're going to hang the crane out over the atrium and just get a shot down because it was a really nice shot. And anyway, the safety officers came up and they go, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that. And they're talking to the director and I just about finished setting the crane up and I thought, I'll just quietly keep going. And then so I got it set up. When they're set up, they're really stable and they're beautiful because they're balanced. And so I just gently eased the crane out over the hole, over the atrium and just let it there. It was perfectly balanced inside. There's no air movement, so I just left it there. And these guys are still arguing, saying we can't do this because it's really dangerous and everything. And I just come up, stood next to them, and you know, and I, I said to the director, I said, oh, so do we? What's how's the shot? Do you want it something like this? And these guys looked around, and they've just taken a double double take and gone, oh my god, what are you doing? That's so dangerous. And I just went, and said, no, it's not really. Come and feel this. It's just they had no idea, and I wouldn't have put it out there if it was dangerous. If you look back on your career. What would you like to have done in film and television? Just sold more cranes. <laughs> I didn't, there was no, I didn't, as I said, I never wanted to be in front of the camera. I never wanted to be anything but in the shadows type guy. And I just like to fly under the radar. I'm definitely not one of these um, attention seeking people. Well, I don't think I am. And I didn't want to do. There's no jobs I actually want to work on so much. As I said before, working on jobs was a means to an end. Did you find many people dealing in that sort of industry did want to sort of like, uh, look at me, look at me, look at me, sort of have that sort of attitude? Yeah, the ones in front of the camera, they're all like that. I'm (laughs) not saying they're not nice people. There's some lovely people who work in the industry and there's some people who aren't so lovely too. But when I was doing trade shows, when I'm selling it, what was different about me than the other guys was 90% of them or more was just salesmen. Whereas I wasn't. I was the engineer who turned into a salesman. 
and I found it was I was never very good I was always quite shy introverted but I had to talk about my product and I found it's very easy to talk about something when you know about it and so that was an interesting bit of self-development I'm not oh well, you wouldn't, probably wouldn't call me shy anymore I don't know but that's just the way it is trade shows is that how you had to come out of the shadows yeah because you've got to stand there and promote your gear just talk us through what you're doing now 2020 was a, a pretty lean year what's happening now what are you what are your projections for 221 business wise not a whole lot um but that doesn't worry me i'm i'm as i said i'm quite comfortable where i am i am expecting to sell a couple of cranes as i said i've got some russian guys who are quite interested in my gear that's good if i sell one two or three cranes that'll be great it's just a bit of money on top for me i um i'm living down south coast new south wales i'm riding my mountain bike when i can um walking on the beach every day every day starts on the beach walking the dog it's you know i feel a bit guilty sometimes that it's it's pretty idyllic life living the dream well i think so sometimes i think i'm starting to shut down but then i'm not that worried about that either you know i my big night is thursday night up the pub and it's a it's a crazy pub it's a lovely pub the guy who owns it's a true eccentric and you know it's it's wonderful and people down there are lovely people it's a nice life i like it and i'm very happy with it peter daniel thanks for joining us over the bonnet thanks mark been lovely having a chat to you